You know this iconic space station. You've seen it in masterpieces like 2001 A Space Odyssey. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. Campy Disney Channel original movies like Xenon Girl of the 21st Century. I'm gonna be in so much trouble. And gritty sci-fi thrillers like Elysium. But did you know that this fixture of our collective space consciousness has a dark past? It was originally presented not just as a waypoint for space exploration, but as an orbital battle station, a plan for a Cold War era US superweapon that could shower atomic destruction down on any terrestrial enemy, like a real life Death Star. <laughs> It all started in the early 1950s, just as the Cold War was gearing up. This was a tense time. The Soviets had just tested their first atomic bomb. The US had failed to gain the upper hand in the Korean War. 200,000 Red Chinese swarmed across the Yellow River. And paranoia that communists were infiltrating American society had taken root with the Red Scare. Communism will never gain a hold in America. Amidst anxiety that the U.S. was losing ground, the popular Collier's magazine published a series on spaceflight, and it captured the American public's imagination. The series kicked off with whimsical depictions of a massive space station, showing men living and working on the final frontier. But it wasn't just fluff. Collier's had partnered with some of the best scientific minds in the U.S. to create this series. And below the engaging illustrations, it had a serious tone. The series' opening text warned that the U.S. must embark on building this station like a new Manhattan project, aimed at securing for the West space superiority. If we don't, it reads, the Soviets will, and whoever fields this station first will control the Earth. The station was the brainchild of Werner von Braun, a brilliant German rocket engineer who had come to work for the U.S. after World War II. He explains the station on Walt Disney's anthology series, Disneyland emphasizing its more family-friendly role as a jumping-off point for space exploration. This advanced base, or space station, will be headquarters for the final ascent to the moon. Our space satellite will have the shape of a wheel, measuring 200 feet across. The entire wheel will slowly rotate at three revolutions per minute. The resulting centrifugal force will produce an artificial gravity for the men in the rim. Von Braun pushed the idea as the next logical high ground. Go up into space, get out of reach of Soviet fighter planes and missiles, then, once you're up there, furnish your untouchable station with telescopes that can surveil every Soviet move and nukes that can retaliate against any Soviet attack. Military reconnaissance experts, aided by powerful optical and radar telescopes, will observe every point on the globe. Or better yet, maybe even let all your adversaries know that preemptive nuclear strikes are on the table, imposing an American-dominated peace, or as Von Braun called it, a Pax Americana, upon the world. This sort of dual-track science, for daring exploration on the one hand and ruthless military dominance on the other, it turns out upon further digging into Von Braun's past, is not so unfamiliar to him. He's very controversial because he was kind of a visionary of space flight. He was the most famous advocate of space flight in the United States in the 1950s and 1960s. And on the other hand, he worked for the Nazis. He had built a weapon that killed people. He was a member of the party, Nazi party. He was a member of the SS. Von Braun excelled at rocketry as a young engineer in Germany. The Nazis took notice and put him in charge of developing one of their most advanced weapons, the V-2 ballistic missile. He's basically in a Faustian bargain with the Third Reich that he gave him all this money and power to build rockets and he was very enthused about going into space with rocketry, but he was quite willing to build weapons. The V-2 missile killed thousands in bombardments of cities like London and Antwerp, but far more died building that weapon. The Nazis kept V-2 production running with concentration camp labor, relentless hours, malnutrition, and horrendous conditions in the tunnels prisoners lived and worked in killed an estimated 10,000 people. Late in the war, he discovered what this regime he was working for was really about. That's when he encountered the concentration camp labor. 
And then in March 1944, he was arrested by the Gestapo, held for 10 days, accused of sabotaging, being part of a secret cell, opposing the Third Reich. It was all ludicrous. It was crazy charges. And so sort of very belatedly, he woke up to the fact that this was an evil regime that he was working for. Still, the whole experience seemed to show Von Braun how quickly resources can mobilize to build rockets when it becomes a military imperative. In the final days of the Third Reich, Von Braun and scores of his scientists surrendered to the Allies. Hungry for his V-2 technology, the U.S. government whisked Von Braun and his team back to America as part of Operation Paperclip. The government also scrubbed the most shameful aspects of his past from public record, burying them deep in classified files. So back in 1952, Von Braun was pushing both the military and scientific cases for his station. The Collier's articles really helped the idea gain traction. Von Braun started drawing larger and larger crowds to his lectures, so many people that thousands allegedly had to be turned away at one he gave in Maryland in 1952. He then presented his idea to a blue ribbon Washington audience. And the president of the Temple University Research Institute soon attempted to back channel the station idea to US President Harry Truman, who allegedly demonstrated interest. But the idea struggled to gain traction within the US government. The defense establishment never liked Von Braun's idea that much. Remember, Von Braun was advocating for a fully functioning space station with nukes, artificial gravity, and life support systems when nobody had even put a satellite into space. It seemed expensive and far-fetched to many, to say the least. The development of intercontinental ballistic missiles in the late 1950s also essentially rendered the military application of Von Braun's station obsolete. Those missiles could be stored, serviced, and launched from a plethora of different places on Earth, so many that the Soviets could probably never knock them all out in a first strike. Von Braun's station, on the other hand, would orbit around the Earth carrying its nukes on a fixed, predictable track, making it an easy target. But more importantly, a major policy shift occurs when Truman leaves office and President Eisenhower takes the reins. Instead of sprinting for space dominance, President Eisenhower envisioned a future where the Soviets and the US would take space off the table as a domain to be fought over and conquered. Putting Von Braun to work under this peaceful space paradigm also made him an American hero. He and his teams built the rockets that put the Mercury program's first Americans into space, and then the Apollo program's first men on the moon. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. This peaceful space paradigm had a profound impact on Von Braun's station. In a sense, it sort of cleaved away the military application of the station, but carried with it the exploratory component that Von Braun always seemed so passionate about. Well into the 1970s, NASA drafted concepts for rotating wheel stations based on Von Braun's idea. The biggest moment for this station, though, came in 1968, when Stanley Kubrick stacked two of Von Braun's stations together in 2001 A Space Odyssey immortalizing the station in sci-fi pop culture forever. Since then, we've seen it everywhere, and its origins as a nuclear-armed battle station sprung from the mind of a former Nazi scientist, needless to say, have largely been forgotten. But with the world spacefaring nations once again talking about weaponizing the final frontier, Space is the world's newest warfighting domain. The story of this station's rise and fall is perhaps more relevant today than it has been at any other time in the last 50 years. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, help us out by liking, subscribing, and dropping us a comment. And to stay updated on Cheddar's latest, hit the bell next to that subscribe button too.